Father, thank you uh, for allowing us to come, uh, many of us long distances, uh, many of us uh, through rough weather, and I ask now that you would help us to take a few moments to be reflective and thoughtful about our ministry. I pray that you would give us all ways to think about that that maybe we haven't thought about before, and that you would encourage us today as we think about what we're doing. And um, we ask mostly that our Lord Jesus would be magnified. We are thankful for him. We are thankful for the part you let us all play in the kingdom. We pray that we would be able to spread his fame throughout the world and that you would encourage us to think more deeply about how we're doing that this week. Prepare us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, welcome everyone uh, to YLT. Uh, My name is Buck Rogers. I am a pastor in Lawrenceville, Georgia. And uh, I have a, uh, I think I went to RYM, and I know some of you know what that is, some of you don't. It's the sort of uh, beach week that, or whatever week, some of them are in the mountains now. Um, it's a, a week-long conference put on, and uh, I went to the first one, in, I went to my first one in 1995, I think. Um, and so I've been going, I think most of, most of my life since then, I've been at RYM and been involved with it. Uh, I was uh, saved in uh, college through a ministry called RUF that much of RYM is based on, the way they think about ministry and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, so my life has been filled since becoming a Christian with what it means to be in ministry, how that works itself out in your life, and RUF And particularly, the way they think about ministry has played a vital role in my life. And so, I am very honored to get to come here today and talk to you about some of those things that have been helpful. Um, Before we get started, I would like, um, if we can, to I'd like to meet you and to know some things from you. So, um, we're going to be together for two hours today. And then we're going to be together, I think, for two more hours on Thursday. And so, some of the stuff that we talk about today may get pushed to Thursday. Don't worry about that. Um, the most important thing is for, I want, is for you to be able to kind of see the big picture of ministry and the way we think about it. So what I want to do is I'd like to go around and just please introduce yourself and tell me what church you're from. And um, I'd like for you to answer the question that's at the top of the sheet I gave you, which is what was the first thing your youth ministry did in 2016? Okay, and that could be an event, a Bible study, your normal meeting, whatever it may be. Just tell me what that is that you did and maybe very briefly why you did it. Okay, that's what I'm interested in. So why don't we start in the back and work our way around. So, yes, speak loudly so we can hear you too. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Very good. <laughs> wow. All right. Okay. Very good. Let's come on down the side here. Ooh. All right. Okay. Okay. 
Fantastic. All right, excellent. Uh, Linda Oliver from First Presidential in Georgia. Uh, first thing we did with our middle schoolers was we called it a big time Wednesday night. Instead of doing like regular YouTube, we just did like, stuff that night, like a few uh, minutes like football. Okay, excellent. Uh, Taylor Gordon from Lexington Press in Lexington, South Carolina. And uh, first thing that we did last week at the United had a day off. Hey, I'm Emily Russell. I'm, I'm an independent Presbyterian church uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. And we were actually in Colorado on a ski trip. We like stayed for New Year. Yeah, it was really far to never ski before. I'm from Mississippi, so we really have a <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> All right, we'll start in the back. Tell me your na- <laughs> your name, your church, and uh, and what your first event was in 2016 with your group. Very 
good. I'm Josh Shelley from Cedar Springs Presbyterian Church in Knoxville, uh, Tennessee. And we did a grilled cheese eating competition in <laughs> Grilled cheese eating competition? Yeah. Was the kid's name Kobayashi or something like that? Okay. Okay. Are you running both those at the same time? <laughs> I was here in Waco, so we had it parents. <laughs> okay. Wow. Wow. Well, welcome. Very good. Uh, my name is Trip Smith, and I go to uh, Peace Church right outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. And um, our first event was going to be a big Panthers, the, the dominant powerhouse Carolina Panthers watch party. Um, but when it snows like a quarter of an inch in, in the middle of North Carolina, people freak out. <laughs> <laughs> Adam Leroy from Alexandria Presbyterian in uh, Virginia. And uh, our first event was a regional uh, student worship event. Thankfully, I didn't have to do anything but show up with my students. But uh, hmm. Tripoli was the speaker. He brought the word, and uh, the worship team was really dynamic. And um, it was special to see which students are here to want to spend their Friday night. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Excellent.
You're a trooper, man. That's good. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. Okay, okay. Did we miss anybody? Did somebody not go? Everybody in here talked. Awesome. Okay. Well, um, what I want you to do for just a minute, okay, is I want you to think about why you did that. Why did you do that event that you did? Why did you do it? Does anybody want to just tell me why you did it? Okay. Okay. Somebody else. Why did you do this? Yeah. You did it last year. Okay. Very good. We went. We had a bowling night at our church, and we did it last year. So that's exactly right. Yeah. Wow. Fair enough. Yes. All right. Any, somebody else? Yep. So you wanted to build relationships, talk to them about the gospel, have them all together, have them in a different environment than you normally would. That's good. What else? Yeah. So are you telling me your parents matter in terms of what you're doing? That's exactly what, yeah. Yeah, that's very, that's very good. What, what else? That's very good. What else? Anybody else? Very good. Well, a lot of this week, all right, is meant to make you think about what you're doing. The real strength of YLT and thinking about things like philosophy ministry that we're going to talk about today that I want to introduce you to, the whole point is to make you reflective and to think about what you're doing. Uh, like I told you earlier, uh, I was introduced to RUF uh, when I was a sophomore in college at Mercer University. I was converted there, and uh, it has really played a vital part of my life ever since then. Um, and when I first became a part of that ministry, our campus minister started talking about philosophy of ministry and using terms like justification and sanctification and things like growing in grace and ministering to other people. And I was, and he, he, 
it was just kind of a random group of ideas and thoughts about ministry that, you know, I had heard maybe some before, but never really understood how they fit together. And my life has been this really long journey of thinking through those things over time and coming to a place where I feel comfortable understanding and having a, a way to sort of bridge the gap between what I believe and what I do. And so, so much of what I want to talk to you about today is thinking about philosophy of ministry and to uh, introduce you to that idea. Now, let me ask you this question. How many of you have had some sort of contact or at least un- know a little bit about what RUF is? Y'all know? Y'all generally? How many of you have never heard of it before and you don't know what in the world that is? A few of you? Okay. RUF is the PCA, which is the Presbyterian Church in America's uh, campus ministry. It's been around since the early 70s. And uh, back in the mid to late 70s, a group of men uh, really started thinking about what would be the best way for the church to influence the campus, the college campus. And so these guys uh, began to really think about ministry, and they thought the best way to minister to college students was for the church to send trained men that had, you know, that went to seminary, that were trained in the area of campus ministry, have thought about campus ministry to the campus to serve as a missionary there. Okay. And so those of you that know about RUF, you probably know a campus minister, a campus pastor, and those guys are actually missionaries to the campus. All right. They go on behalf of the church to the campus to raise up a group, to help them understand and know the gospel, and to send them out for God's kingdom. And so much of what happened in the early days with RUF, a group of men started thinking about why we do what we do in ministry, and particularly how that influences the campus, and that has just exploded. It is probably the best thing the PCA is doing these days. And uh, much of that way of thinking about ministry has trickled down now to where uh, people who were involved with RUF now have kids, and they want that same sort of influence and thought about ministry with their children. And so what I want to do today is to introduce you to that. Now, look, there's two things that I want you to know about me when I talk to groups like this. The first is, is I'm very interactive. I want you to talk I want you to ask questions, okay, along the way. So feel free. And I may say, let's hold that to the end and come back to it. Or I may say, I'm going to talk about that at another time. But just realize that I'm very open to you talking to me, okay? The second thing is, is this is my information up here. If you you think of something, you're like, I don't want to interrupt right now, or I want to ask that question later, you can call me, text me, email me, let me know, or just hunt me down. I'll be here all week. And I'd love to talk to you more about how this works. So that being said, I want to talk to you. uh, I'm going to follow through this sheet. I've given you kind of a one sheet front and back with a little bit about where we're going to go today. And I want to spend the first um, little bit of our time talking about um, exactly why a philosophy of ministry is important and what that is. Now, some of you, when I ask you why you did the event that you did, uh, some of you gave me answers like we wanted kids to know about the gospel. Some of you said, we've always done it. You know, some of you, I'm sure, are thinking, I'm shooting from the hip. I hadn't been at this church very long, and I'm just trying to figure out what to do, right? Um, There's a lot of reasons for us. And the first question I ask is, why are you practicing ministry the way that you do? Why are you doing these things that you do at your church? Why do you do events? Why do you have youth group? Why do you do what you do at youth group? Why do you meet with students? How does this all fit into the big picture of what you think about church and your church is doing in the community and that sort of thing? And here are some of the common answers you see here on the sheet. Um, One is that we're just shooting from the hip. You know, we're just trying to figure out, you know, we're doing what we can the best we can. Some of you work part-time. Some of you, you know, have not been involved with youth ministry for very long. Another big one is tradition, right? Okay, we're doing things because they've always been done this way, and I'm kind of scared to screw around with it at this point. Right, I don't want to mess up what's been going on. Um, a third one that's kind of popular, at least in our uh, culture, is we want to create little smart Presbyterian reform people, you know, that are going to go out into the world and be smart little reform people. Um, a third one is uh, that we want to try to get as many people as we can to come to our youth group. You know, that's really what we're, tr- we're trying to do events so people will come here. We want to attract, we want to have this attractional model where people will come. Uh, some of you are doing what you do to please the parents because you don't want them mad at you because you think they'll get you fired if you don't have them at least pleased in some sort of way. Um, and most of us, if not all of us, uh, do what we do because it works. Okay? Uh, we, 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 we've seen it work before. Maybe it worked when you were in youth ministry 
or with what's happened in the youth ministry at this point, and for pragmatism's sake, you're doing this. Somebody had a question in the back? Yeah. Mm-hmm. There are two of them, and they're on the chairs back there. Beautiful. You got it. You got it. So, um, I want you to tell me the difference between these two terms, okay? Okay? Theology, methodology. Y'all tell me the difference between those two things. What are they? Yes. Okay, that's good. That's good. Study of God. Met, let's think about it in terms of, of terms of ministry. Theology is sort of what we know about God and sort of, you know, uh, what, what we feel and know about Scripture and what Scripture teaches about ministry. Methodology is why we're doing the things, you know, the things that we do. The, the events that you all just talked about are part of your methods, okay? And so the question is, is what is the relationship between these two things? Between what you believe and what you're doing. What is the way you think about the relationship between those two things? Um, shoot, tell me now, what are some ways that you think about that? How do you think these two things relate to each other? Yeah. Okay, so you're saying it runs this way. Okay, all right, what else? Anybody else? Yeah. Okay, you say, so they, you say there's some sort of reflectiveness that's going on here where you're, th you're thinking about the way you're doing things and it's affecting the, the way you think about what you believe. Okay, anybody else? Well, you're doing something. What I want you to know is you're doing something there. You're all doing it. Okay, whether you like it or not, whether it's shooting from the hip tradition, no matter what it is, you're doing something here, all right? And that thing that you're doing here is a philosophy. It's answering the big questions about why you're doing what you're doing. And whether you do that a little or whether you do that a lot, you're doing it. Okay? You're synthesizing how you believe things and how it's going to affect the way you do things in your life or vice versa. All right? And um, what's interesting is, is that a lot of times we think about this idea and we think, well, of course, my theology is going to inform my big questions, and my big questions are going to inform the way I do things, right? We think that way, but far too often, um, it's not how it works, okay? H how many of you know uh, what um, the, uh, the prosperity gospel is? Do you know what the prosperity gospel is? you know who Joel Olstein is? you ever heard of Joel Olstein? Okay, tell me a little bit about what you know about him and about the prosperity gospel. What is that? God will make you rich. Okay, what else? Hmm, that's good. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yes, yes. I mean, the, the, the sole idea is this, is if, if you really follow God, you will prosper. You will be successful. Good things will happen to you. If you kind of follow these steps and you move toward God in some way, these good things will happen to you. And so what happens is, do you know how many times Joel Osteen talks about Jesus? How many times? Do you all know how often he speaks about Jesus? Rarely. You know how many times he actually talks about the Bible? Rarely. And it's because his pragmatism, his method of wanting things, what works, which is, I'm going to tell you that you'll prosper if you do good things, works and people come in droves to think about that. And so it begins to affect what? His theology. Yeah, it's, 
the real question you've got to ask about these two things is which one is driving, right? And in, in the prosperity gospel, your methods are driving. You're saying this works, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe tweak my theology a little bit to make sure that this continues to work. Maybe I'm not going to talk about the gospel. I'm not going to talk about Jesus. I'm not going to talk about the word because those things are offensive, and they would cause people to think they may. What did you say earlier? Do you remember? What, what, what does this leave out? Yeah. Suffering. Yeah, it le- like the word suffering is taboo here, you know, when you, when you think about the prosperity gospel because nobody wants to hear that. So it allows your methodology to drive your theology, and that's what we want to avoid. So the temptation for us is the reversal. I want you to know that. The temptation for you is to reverse this order, to think, I'm going to let my methods drive what we believe, you know. And this is why so many youth ministries across the country are, you know, a thousand miles wide and two inches deep. That's the big complaint, right? And I think that's one thing we push back hard on in our tradition a lot of times is we want there to be depth and, and, and we want there to be some sort of um, deep spiritual growth in terms of what we do. And the reason we do that is because we fight this temptation that we have toward pragmatism. Right? We don't want to let pragmatism or methodology drive what we do. So um, what do we need in order to make that happen? What's the, what's the best way to think about this so that this... Uh, so this, we're guarded against that. And what I want to propose to you is, is that you, uh, we have a philosophy of ministry where theology is fixed. It does not change. We're secure in our theology. We know what we believe. We have standards for what we believe. Which in almost all your traditions that I heard today, you all do, Right? We're pretty strong in this area. We, are, have, we have a fixed theology. We believe these set of things. But our methods are flexible. Okay? And I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to all unclench your shoulders right now. And I'm going to say something to you that hopefully will cause you to relax a little bit. You don't have to do things at your church the way they've always been done. You don't. You don't have to do things the way they've always been done. I know there's a lot of fear involved in that statement, okay? But your methods are flexible. A philosophy of ministry says, my theology is fixed, it's not going to change, and it's going to inform the way I do things. And that may mean I don't do the things the way I used to do them. You know, there may be more minority students involved in my youth group, and I have to change things. Because I can't function the way we used to function, you know? The demographic may change, uh, all sorts of things may become different in your group where you have to think about it differently. So um, a philosophy of ministry is a set of ministry dynamics, and I'm going to use these words and you'll hear them a lot today, purpose, presuppositions, principles, goals, and avenues. You're going to hear those things over and over again, all right, that keep us faithful to our beliefs. In other words, we want to develop a philosophy that allows us not to lose our convictions, that keeps us here where, we, where, we, where these things remain fixed and we allow these things to be flexible. And so much of what I want to talk to you about today is how we do that and what that looks like. Um, a few things just to remember. Um, one, it, this is not, a philosophy of ministry is not a set of skills or programs that you can follow. You know, we, we're very, um, we're going to be very careful to say a philosophy of ministry is not like this box and you put a student in it, and the student pops out a disciple. We don't, that's, that's uh, you'll hear later on, that that's, uh, we're afraid of thinking that way. That's not good thinking. Rather, a philosophy is a grid by which we think about what we're doing. It's a grid by which we um, consider our theology in terms of the decisions we're making about ministry. Okay? Does this, does this at least make sense to you? Or can I get some, some sort of, are y'all driving with me? Okay. So, we want to move from theology to methodology, and we want to do that by having a philosophy of ministry. Well, how do we do that? How do we develop a philosophy of ministry? Well, if you'll see on the outline, letter A, we have a fixed theology, which in, at least in our case in the PCA is um, the scriptures and our standards for understanding those of the Westminster Confession of Faith, the larger and smaller catechisms. Some of you have different uh, traditions that you come from that they may be different, but yet you have fixed theology, and that fixed theology is causing you to come to a theological and contextual reflection about what you're doing. 
And that will lead you to your methods and what you're going to do and how you're going to do them. But what I want you to remember is that your methodology is flexible. Your theology is fixed. And we're going to figure out, we're going to have some sort of grid for you to move through to try to figure out how to make those decisions. All right? That's the, that's the starting point for us. And I want you to see that the starting point in your philosophy has to be that you are reflective. Okay? That you are thinking about what you're doing. It is not unusual at our church for us to have meetings during the week, probably two to three meetings a week, where we just evaluate things and talk about them. How did this go? Tell me about these meetings that you had with students. What did you talk about? How did you talk to them about those things? Let's talk about our youth group the other night. What did we feel good about that meeting? Was it helpful to us? Um, was it a good time for us to be with the students? Did we feel like we were accomplishing what we wanted to accomplish? Let's talk about this event that we had this past month or whatever. Let's talk about the lock-in. Let's talk about uh, the parents' meeting. Let's, talk about, let's think about these things and ask serious questions about how they are helping us accomplish what we're supposed to be accomplishing together. Okay? You have to be reflective. Otherwise, the temptation is to let your methods drive what you do, and the temptation is for you to move toward a, a sort of default in ministry of fear and living that way, if you're not reflective. Um, I've written a few things here about reflection and its importance to you. Um, reflection um, is necessary for ministry, and it's uh, necessary because it brings an awareness that, uh, about things that you normally don't consider. Um, what are some things, what are some ways that you reflect about yourself in ministry? What are some reflective questions that you, uh, that you maybe ask yourself? as you do ministry. Oh, very good. Yeah, is my ministry all to Christians? Or am I minister? do I have any kind of ministry to non-Christians? That's a great question to ask yourself. Very good. And really, the deeper question is, you're probably going to say, I don't have a lot of non-Christians. A lot of us, at least in the white bread world we live in, don't have that. And we have to ask ourselves why. That's the deeper question. Why is it that I don't spend more time with non-Christians? Okay, what else? Yeah. That's good. All right, so that's a question, that's a, a reflective question about students, but what, how can you reflect that question about yourself? Mm. Very good. Do I know my students? Do I spend time with them and want to know them? Do I treat this like a job? Or do I really want to know them as a human being? That's great. Great thing. What else about yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Is, is my relationship with students just you know, kind of this fun peer relationship? And why would it be that way? Or do they see me more like a dad and not feel like they can approach? But why do they feel that way? Those are all good questions about yourself. Why am I, you know, how do I, how am I perceived by these people? What else? I like your questions. They're very good. Because ultimately, you're asking the question, am I supposed to do this? Right? And that's, that's a very valuable question to ask yourself. Am I supposed to be doing this? Am I called to do this? Um, am I made to do this? Am I strong in areas that really help these students? Or am I just, you know, is there somebody better that should be doing this than me? I don't think those are unhealthy questions to ask, right? They're thinking about you. What else? Other questions about yourself? Yeah. How am I loving and pursuing the students that are hard to love versus those that are... Yeah, now that says a lot about yourself, doesn't it? Yeah, that's very good. Am I, am I just doing what's easy for me and comfortable for me in ministry? Yeah. Uh, am I comfortable in doing this specific task? Hmm. 
Yeah, or do I need help? <laughs> That's the huge ministry question, isn't it? Do I need help? Or am I trying to carry this load by myself? Another big one that I think about a lot for myself is what, what are my motives here? Why am I doing this? Do I really love this person? Am I just going through the motions? You know, and another question is, how, how is this, you know, it, how is this vertically affecting me? You know, is there a vertical effect to what I'm doing? <laughs> reflective about yourself. Another way that we're reflective is about our ministry. A lot of you have already said some of those things. You know, what are some, do you guys meet as a staff or with your parents and talk about what you're doing and why you're doing it? Do y'all ever have these kind of, what are some of the questions that go around when you have those sort of meetings? Yeah, or from other people on your staff or whatnot. You know, when you have discussions about the ministry and what you're doing. Yeah. Hmm. Right, right. I know in our staff meetings, we'll ask questions like, um, when we have a large group meeting on Wednesday nights or Sunday nights, um, why are we doing the things that we're doing there? Do we, need to, do we need to cut down on games? Or do we need to have better games? Yeah, those are silly. It seems like, uh, some, in some ways, irrelevant questions, but they're very relevant in terms of thinking through what we're doing, thinking through our methods. Why are we doing these things? Okay. Um, another area is awareness of your students. What are questions that you ask about your students? What are, how are you thinking about them reflectively? Hmm. Right. Hmm. Good. What are other ways you reflect about your students? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of you, when you meet with your students, talk about their parents? Most of you do that. It's kind of unavoidable, right? Um, and those aren't easy conversations sometimes, are they? But you have, to be, you have to be reflective about their mom and dad, what's going on at home, what they're doing the vast majority of their day, how they're living, what they think is important, who their friends are, or do they have girlfriends or boyfriends? How does that affect their life? What's their schoolwork life? What's their relationship with school? You know, uh, what's their relationship with the church? How are they getting... There are thousands of questions we can think about in terms of, of you know, evaluating me reflective about our kids, you know. And the, what I want you to... Ask, I'm just simply saying, are you thinking about that? You know, is that something that you do? And we want to give you an environment to do that a lot this week, okay? I know right now I've sat in your seats in both youth ministry and campus ministry settings, and I know what you're doing right now. You're thinking, you know, there are a bunch of things that I haven't thought about and I need to think about them. Write them down. Don't hesitate to do that this week. This is, we want to give you an opportunity, a springboard, to think about these things in your life and be reflective about them. Um, Last one is sort of a spiritual awareness. Um, are, you, are you being reflective spiritually? And not just for your students, but for you. What does it look like in your life for you to abide in Jesus? To be with him? What do you, how do you feel about um, your Christian life right now? How do you feel about your relationship with Jesus Christ at the moment? Do you reflect about what's hard about that and how living the Christian life is not always what you thought it was going to be? Does it ever, um, th is the Christian life disappointing to you? Is the ministry life disappointing for you? Are you sad about these things at times? 
Do you, do you reflect, do you speak to God about that? Are you moving toward him or away from him spiritually in your life? And how is that affecting the way you talk to people about him? Do you see his goodness? Do you see the value of the kingdom? And how is that affecting the way you communicate to young people? How is that working itself out in the way that you, you think about ministry? Okay? Um, there's so many important questions for you to consider and to think about in terms of your life. Um, there's, a great, um, question, there's a great quote here at the end by Jeremy Jones, who was a an RUF pastor for a long time. Now he's a pastor. He did a lot of work on philosophy of ministry and stuff. But he said this, We need reflection because we are given to default ministry practices. These are your stock of programs, ideas, sayings, methods, etc., that you will tend to grab and implement out of panic or presumption. What are some of those things for you? What are some of your defaults, your ministry defaults, uh, that, you, that you lean on uh, when you don't reflect? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? It's <laughs> great. Yes. Yes. That's good. One of my favorite sayings is. I don't know. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. I say that all the time. Let's pray about that. Let's think about that. What do your parents think? Those are starting to go to. Yes. Um, let me ask you this last question before we kind of finish and move toward what the philosophy of ministry is that I want to you know, consider. And that is, why are you resistant to reflection? Why is it that this is hard for us? Okay. How does it do that? Mm. Mm. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Very good. Yeah. It's exposing of, you know, your soul. Yeah. Uh, I want to be right all the time when I reflect and just be able to think that I'm doing wrong. And I need to go away from the reflection. Mm, very good. Reflection takes time. That's, that's so important. You know, I'm just too busy to reflect, right, and think about things. Very good. Somebody in the back earlier I thought had their hand up. Anybody? Why else is, why is reflection, why are we resistant to it? Anybody else? Hmm. Yeah. There's more important things to do. Yeah. I think maybe unlike anything else, reflection exposes dependence. It exposes that you cannot operate independently. It exposes that you need God. When you really reflect and really consider your motives, and while you're doing the things that you do, it exposes failure. It exposes fears in us. And that's why we don't want to do it. Okay? But what I want you to see, and this is very important, is it may expose those things, but it is by it doing that that you are probably more transformed and moved toward the kingdom than at any other time. I think it's, it's no coincidence that some of the greatest times of reflection in your life were when you were suffering. You know, when you really had time to think, 
when you went a little deeper than normal because you had the time or because circumstance pushed you there and it was hard. Um, but reflection is beautiful and good for us, all right? And it's how we're going to move toward this. So um, what I want to do is, let's see what time it is. It's 4.39. I want to take a 10-minute um, break. You can go to the bathroom, do whatever you need to do. And then when you come back in, we're going to talk about uh, what um, a, a biblical philosophy of ministry looks like. I'm going to give you sort of a picture of that and maybe get your head cranking around while you're doing some of the things you're doing in ministry. Okay, so please take 10 minutes. Please be back in here at um, 4.50. We'll start back at 4.50. Thanks.
Excellent. All right. Welcome back. Some of you are not back yet. Okay. But we're going to jump right in. Um, on this sheet that I gave you, okay, on the top, there's a space here. So it says the forest. And then there's a section that says the trees. And it has all these terms. Okay. And I'm going to explain a little bit about that for you. Um, when I first started learning about philosophy of ministry, people used the terms on the bottom where it says the trees a lot, all right? They would use things like purpose, presuppositions, principles, goals, avenues, and I was really confused and had no idea what that meant. And so a lot of what I want to talk to you about now is how those things fit together because you're going to spend a lot of time this week, and if you ever come back here again, talking about those individual things, the trees, but what I want to talk to you is about the forest and how they all work together today. And it's very important that you kind of understand that or when you go listen to Justin talk about principles tomorrow, you're going to be like, I don't, what's a principle? I don't know what you're talking And this is going to help you to make sense of that. Um, these the, the, sort of the little uh, beginning sections of those are, are Joey Stewart's and uh, they're very helpful. Our mission is the purpose. Our mode are the presuppositions. Our motor are the principles. Our measure is are the goals and our methods are the avenues. Now, you're, once again, you're reading that and you're thinking, I don't know what the hee-haw he's talking about, and that's fine, but I'm going to make it make sense, I promise. And I'm going to deal with these two guys, okay? All right, so what I need to do is to talk to you about why you're doing what you're doing and giving you some sort of grid to think about ministry. So here is you, okay? We'll just, you know, this is probably how you feel most of the time. Just kidding. This is you, okay? And this is a student, all right, in your group, all right? And so the question, the first and major question is, what are you doing with this person? Like, what are you trying to accomplish? What, what do you want from this person? What are you trying to do? What, what are you trying to accomplish? What do you want? You want them to know Jesus, all right? Very good, all right? And what else do you want them to do? You own the growing maturity. That's very good. Um, in, our, in our confession of faith, the Western Confession of Faith, it says that the purpose of the church is to gather and perfect the saints. That's the purpose of God's people. To gather those who don't know God, introduce him, them to God by the gospel, and that they may grow and become what they're meant to be. Perfection is, you know, not what you necessarily mean. It means you're becoming what you're made to be. All right? And so what we want to do with this person, I feel sad about that. We'll go back to this, okay? The purpose in terms of what we're doing is twofold. We are reaching them with the gospel, and we are equipping them to serve Jesus in their life. That's the twofold purpose behind everything that you're trying to do. So when you lock students in a building for a night, this is what you want. Now, it may not be the end result, it may take forever, but that's a piece of the purpose. Like, whatever you're doing, parents' meetings, uh, you know, going to sh shoot uh, Nerf at each other, that's the end goal. You want to reach them with the gospel, and you want to equip them to serve Jesus in their life. Okay? Um, and so that has to be, as Joey says in this thing, our mission, what we want to do, how we're trying to accomplish. And, and, it, and it really should beg of you, to ask, what is my focus in youth ministry? What am I trying to accomplish? Um, and if, if it's not to reach and equip, then why am I doing what I'm doing? You know, what, what am I trying to accomplish here? All right? So our purpose is to reach and equip them uh, for Jesus Christ. Now, before we move any further in terms of what, how we do that, where that goes, all that sort of stuff, there are things that are true about you and me that are going on in us all the time that you don't realize. That's going to influence how we do that. Okay, you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about equipping, that we want them to know Jesus Christ and to seek his kingdom. You know, and, and that, that looks different. We're going to explain how that looks different along the way for different people 
and how that works as we go. But that's, the end, that's what we're wanting to do is equip them to serve Jesus Christ in the world and to, to be a part of his kingdom and to seek his kingdom. Is that helpful? Help a little bit? You're still... Okay. Okay. We can use perfect if you want to use that. Just kidding. That's what the confession uses. Anybody else? Any other questions before we move on? Purpose is to reach and equip this person with the gospel. So before we go any further, there are certain things that are true about us that are going on in the background that we think about that are, um, that are true in terms of what we are doing in ministry, sort of our foundations, what we're standing on, that we call uh, presuppositions. In other words, um, they're what I like to call the operating system of our philosophy of ministry. You, what's an operating system? What's it? How many of you have a computer or a phone? It has an operating system. What does that mean? It's a program that is running, right? And it's running in the background and it's doing things all the time. You don't know what it's doing, but it's making the phone work or the computer work. Um, and, and it's a set of programs. It's a set of ideas and technology that work together in the background that you don't have to think about. You just go, I'm going to type a document and it works. I'm going to get on the internet, it works. I'm going to do this. And it, this is, but these things are working in the background. Another way to talk about these things are they're sort of our DNA. They're what make us who we are, all right? And what we want these, things, these presuppositions to be are biblical presuppositions about us, all right? These are things that in our philosophy of ministry are true about us and who we are. They're our mode, what we're like, all right? And we have uh, sort of narrowed these down, all right, in our philosophy of ministry to seven things. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to talk to you more about these things later in the week. So if you have questions about these, uh, write them down, and I'll be glad to answer them because I'm going to talk about presuppositions for an hour on Thursday, okay? But these are sort of the DNA things that are working behind the scenes in terms of what we're doing. The first is this, <clears throat> is that we have a theology from Scripture. In other words, we, we have a theology that's biblical, the Bible is our foundation. It is our only rule of faith and practice. And out of the scriptures comes theology, things that we know about God, a study of God in terms of what we're doing. And that's going to run and rule what we do. Okay? And we all believe that, I hope. You know, I can remember um, uh, when, I was, when I was in, uh, when I did RUF at Mercer, um, our group was really small when I first started there. Um, and uh, I had, there was this really big Baptist ministry on campus, and the Baptist guy came to me once, and he said, do you think there are any of your leaders that would like to work at my church? And, and I'm thinking, dude, you, you know this is like the Presbyterian ministry, you know, you're, you're, you want, and he's, he's like, I, I understand that, but when I look on campus and I see people that are serious about the Bible, it's these kids. So do you think any of the, and it was the, one of the highest compliments I was ever paid as a campus minister, because I knew that this was being, this was being seen as operating in the background in terms of the way my kids think, okay? And so the question is, is, is this operating in the background in terms of the way you think about ministry? I am going to, I have a theology, I am operating under the understanding that scripture is, um, is the, my only rule of faith and practice, so to speak. A second one that we have, I'm going to do them in order of the sheet, um, that God is at work. Okay? This is a presupposition. In other words, this means you believe, your default position as a Christian is that God is doing something. Okay? He's not just kind of spinning the world leaving. It's not like he's detached from your work, but he is at work in what you're doing all the time. All the time. He doesn't stop working. He doesn't take a break. He is at work all the time. He is in a constant provision for his people. And so how should that as an operating, part of your operating system affect the way you talk to kids? Yeah, yeah. Hopeful, you know, absolutely. What else? Yeah. 
Right, yeah. If part of your DNA is providence, God is providing and taking care of things in the background, he's always at work, then that means you can sit down and have the worst one-on-one with a student and God be doing something in their life. It can also mean that you have the best one-on-one that you've ever had with a student and they walk away and they're, you know, nothing's different, okay? Um, It means that God is the one who is willing and doing in your relationships with students. It means he's the one that is doing, and and it also means, what what should that mean in terms of what we want to do with students, where we want them to be, where we want them to go? If God is the one at work, then what are we trying to get students to do? Yes. Yes. And we want them to, to, to move toward him, right? The one who is at work, the one who is changing the world, the one who is pushing back the curse, the one who's bringing the kingdom in this world. We want them to know him, okay? It is our hope as well. So the, the idea that God is at work, that he is doing these things and he is, um, it, it's sort of an important part of uh, our confidence as people who are ministers of the gospel, what else? Why, why, why else is it important for us to know that he's at work in what we're doing? Hmm. That's good. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> Beautiful. It drives your pride away, doesn't it? You know, like this is not about me. This is about what God's doing. Okay, very good. All right, so that's a very important part of what we're doing, and it's operating in the background in terms of our lives. The third one. Um, the church. Now, this is very important because, and I'm going to go ahead and put uh, the fourth one down too, which is the family, because these things are very similar to one another. They have so much to do with one another. Tomorrow, I think it's tomorrow, Joey is going to talk to you about being a covenantal youth ministry. Okay? And I, that is probably one of the most uh, beautiful things you're going to hear. That is gold tomorrow. Please listen up. Drink your coffee and be ready. Because he's going to try to get you to think about ministry, not just in terms of a one-on-one individual, I'm trying to change this person, but that we are in this together. That we have a community of faith and that God is at work, not just one-on-one, but in the community. Okay? And so that means when it comes to your youth ministries, you want parents involved. You want volunteers involved. You want friends, and you want college students, you, you want other people, you want older students ministering to young, you want the community effect to push in on what we're doing. And you're going to see that tomorrow. But these two things are very important because we realize that um, the, uh, my pastor back in uh, Lawrenceville says this. He says that the church is the primary channel by which God is changing the world. It's, it's the primary channel by which God's mercy is flowing out to the world, all right? And we believe that. And so whenever we're ministering to students, our goal is, because this is a presupposition, our goal is not just to bring them to Jesus in some sort of isolation, but it's to bring them to his people. Okay, we want them to relate to God's people and see that this is who Jesus is married to. You know, it's like uh, it's someone who has a relationship with me but doesn't know my wife is really not getting the full picture. <laughs> you know, there's really a sense in which uh, because we're united to Jesus Christ, uh, you having this relationship with the church is very important in terms of what we're doing. So, like I said, we'll talk more about these uh, coming up, and Joey's going to talk a lot about those tomorrow. Um, the last three, number five, uh, I'm going to say is the learning process. 
And um, this basically means that we think, uh, we, we believe that people, most people learn the same way, okay? That the people you minister to are all learning similarly, all right? We draw this from scripture, that people learn, but they're taught about things. And as they're taught and they learn these things, uh, we demonstrate for them what happens and why these things are working. You see Jesus not only preaching, but he demonstrates it with miracles or demonstrates it with his actions or demonstrates it with his relationships. And then we observe our friends and what's happening. We evaluate them. We encourage them. We're going to talk more about that process uh, on Thursday. But we, we, we know in the background that there's this process by which people are learning and growing. Okay? Um, and then the last two, which I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put them together, are demographics and the individual. Okay. So, um, this, is, this may be uh, my favorite part of the whole philosophy of ministry. And this is what has crucially changed in the way I think about ministry um, since I was in college. All right? And that is this. I think when I was in college, I thought discipleship worked this way. You have this box, and you take somebody, and you put them in the box, and you say, here are the things you need to learn. This is who Jesus is. This is what the church is. This is what it means to be a disciple. This is what the Bible is. This is how we learn. This is how we grow. And once you've kind of taught them this set of doctrines, they come out, and they're a disciple. Okay? And it doesn't matter who it is. You put them in the box. You teach them these things, and they come out a disciple. All right? And that's the way I thought about ministry. And believe it or not, that's probably the way 80 to 90% of people in your, in your church think about ministry. I'm going to put people in a box and I'm going to teach them a set of things and they're going to come out a disciple of Jesus, okay? And what understanding demographics in the individual says is that that is impossible, okay? It doesn't work that way. Because number one, we're all different, okay? Don't you think that when you put a white person in the box versus a black person in the box, that you, you can't, that it, there's a different approach you have to take to each one because they're different. They have different experiences in life. When you put a woman in the box versus a man in the box, you have to take a different approach because they look at the world differently. They think about the world differently. And not only that, not only in terms of gender and race and those sort of things, but just each individual person has been through different experiences. Your family is different than my family. Your relationship with your wife or with your kids or with your children is different than my relationship with my wife and kids and children and so on and so forth. And so when it comes to talking about the gospel with those people, we have to think about what they're like, right? I mean, you, you have to have seen this. And not only in terms of each individual person, but in terms of what the, the group is like. You know, like your group at your church is different than my group at my church. They're different. Okay, my kids are white bread, suburbanite, middle to upper class. You know, that's their demographic. Some of your class years are inner city, uh, mixed, different, whatever they may be. We have different demographics. I'll tell you a funny story about that. When I was um, <clears throat> the campus minister at Mercer. Okay, so Mercer is this sort of uh, middle upper class, um, high leadership, uh, athletic sort of school, believe it or not. And... Um, Mercer, um, I, I, my first year when I started there, there was a, my best friend started doing RUF at Emory University in Atlanta, okay, which is highbrow, super smart people, uh, lots of minorities, very different than Mercer. And so my friend has a buddy in Atlanta, and he's like, hey, man, I got like 10 tickets to the Hawks game. Why don't you get four students? I'll get four students. We'll go to the Hawks game together, and that'll be fun. I'm like, yeah, that'd be awesome. So, of course, I go. And I find these four guys that are JV basketball players at Mercer to come with me to this particular Hawks game. So I get them. We all get there early. We're eating at a restaurant, waiting on the Emory kids to come. <clears throat> and we're sitting there. And, like, we start noticing all around there are just nerds everywhere. I mean, super nerds. And they're, like, in little groups of four or five. And they're all dressed in, like, uh, nerd uniforms. They're all dressed very similarly. You know, like they're obviously little teams of nerds that are meeting and doing things together. <clears throat> and of course, the JV basketball players are just ripping on them. You know, they're making fun of, oh my gosh, man, I can't believe, it. look at these guys, they're such nerds. 
And what it was is they were having the high school robotics competition at the Congress Center, which is right next to where the Hawks play. And so, like, they were, like, on segways, you know, going around together. And, <clears throat> you know, they're building these robot things. And so my guys are just ripping them. And they're just making jokes because, you know. And so the Emory students come in. And uh, they all sit down and we start talking and they're like, hey man, did you say, I guess, see those really nerds outside and all, you know, they were making fun of them and all the Emory students just get really quiet. And they're like, yeah, man, we all did that in high school. You know, they, they had all participated in the robotics competition in high school. And so there was a lot of repenting my basketball player friends and me had to do because it was this clash of demographics. They're so different. You know, I got one group of kids who make fun of robotics and I got another who like find their identity in it, right? And so when it comes to the, when it comes to ministering to those students, you have to think about them differently, right? I, I don't know if I would, I, I would not be a very good campus minister at Emory because I feel like my personality pushes against those things. My friend Hunter would have been a terrible uh, guy at Mercer, uh, because his personality pushes so hard against the type of guys that were there. And so we have to think about demographics and what people are like as individuals when we minister to them. There is a contextualization that has to occur when we think about people. So what does that mean about your ministry? What does that mean about the way you approach students? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think like you were talking earlier, a lot of reflection, what is working, what's not working. Hmm. Yeah. How about this? What is my group like? Like, what are these people like? How would you describe your group and what they love and what they hate? What would, how would you, like, what are their, um, uh, you know, what, not only what are their races and, um, and those sort of things, they're, they're, you know, is it heavy women, heavy, you know, whatever it may be. But like, how do these people think about the world? How are they managing life? Do they come from predominantly difficult households? Or are they coming from like really easy, comfortable households? How am I, th you know, you've got to think about your students and try to find out what they're like. In other words, this may be the most important thing you walk away, but you've got to know them. If you don't know them, then it's going to be very difficult to minister to them. It's going to be very difficult not to default to putting them in the box and teaching them about the Bible and hoping they come out disciples. Because believe me, it's different to talk to a girl whose parents are divorcing and, it, and where she's been abused about the gospel than it is a, a, a rich white kid from the suburbs. They, they have different problems. The gospel addresses them in different ways, Okay. And the only way you're going to be able to apply the gospel to their life is what? To know them. You have to know them, okay? And so working in the background all the time needs to be the presupposition is everybody's different here, okay? I've got to help people. The gospel comes to bear differently with different people at different times. I need to know my people, okay? I've got to know what they're like. I've got to know their hearts. So these are sort of the things we stand on that are working in the background as we try to reach and equip this person, okay? Now, let's shift gears for a second. Um, what do we, when we say we want to reach and equip this person, if, like just think about students in your group right now. What do you want to see coming out of them in their lives? What do you want to see happening in their life in the way they live? Tell me some things. Faith and repentance. Oh, that's so good. You want to see them believing in Jesus Christ and their lives being changed regularly because they believe. That's good. Okay. Um, faith and repentance. I'll just put that. What else? What else do you want to say? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm going to put a biblical worldview. World and life view. What else? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. Okay, what else? Yep. Okay. 
Okay. You want, flesh that out. What do you mean, compassion? Mm. Loving others. All right, what else? Yeah. Okay. Local church. You want to see them connected, fellowship, right? That's good. What else? Okay, good. Identity in Jesus. What else? Hmm? Joy. Oh, that's very good. Joy in the gospel. Okay. Anybody else? These are good things. Yep. Yes. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lump some of these together because I'm running out of room on the board. Okay. Okay. One of them that you all seem to be focusing on that is very good, which I love about youth ministers and people who are ministering to youth, are that you want them to grow in grace. You know, that means loving scripture. That means, you know, understanding the Bible. That means caring about uh, God and wanting to be close to him. Some of you also said that you want them uh, to fellowship with other Christians. You want them to be around the church. We talked about that. What are some other things? Come on. What do you want? Okay, that you want them to, to, yeah, you want fellowship, a closeness. You also want them uh, to serve them, to think of them as more important than themselves. You know, you want to develop that in them. What else? Hmm. Okay, very good. Yeah, blown away by the fact that he cares for them. Uh, that's very good. What else? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, that we are on a mission together. You know, you're, you're, not just, you're not just trying to maintain a group. Like, your group is substantially different than the YMCA or, uh, you know, Boy Scouts. Your group is different because your group is on a mission together. You're all going to do something. You're seeking the kingdom, right? You want, the king, you want to spread Jesus' fame throughout the world. That's what you want. And so there's a mission, and I'm going to put evangelism here, right, that you want them to share what God is doing in their life and that sort of thing. Somebody said earlier, a biblical worldview. These are um, what we call our goals in ministry. You see them here, okay? I've just kind of synthesized them down to these four things. Now, this is important. To, this is an important question to ask. Like, outwardly, the Pharisees did all these things. Y'all know that, right? Okay. So what, where do we want these things to come from? Where do they need to originate in these people? Absolutely. Yeah. They have to come out of their hearts. So look, how does that affect the way we think about ministry then? If, if what you want to do is to see them growing in Jesus or loving one another or uh, spreading the gospel and being on mission or having this view of the world, how do we get that? Where do we have to engage them? Is it by putting them in a box and teaching them six things? How do you engage them? Where do you, how do you see, and when you're looking at your students and you see one and you're like, he really is growing. She really is growing. What has happened? Is that some sort of outward behavior they've just figured out? Yeah, there is something inwardly that's changing. Okay? And so the philosophy of ministry says that when we reach and equip other people for Jesus Christ, our students, that we're engaging their heart. We have to engage their hearts. It's not a matter of trying to modify their behavior. This is a very hard thing for those of you. How many of you are parents? Are any of you in here parents? This is excruciating for parents because we're so tempted toward behavior modification. Like, I just want my kids to behave, right? And meanwhile, they're pissed off, you know, inside, or they're angry, or they're sad. And I haven't engaged their hearts. I'm just trying to change the way they live. And so that's a, a, a consistent thing we need to reflect on in our philosophy of ministry is, are we engaging the heart of these people? Okay. So these are what we call our goals. And um, not only are they what we're shooting for, 
But they're the way by which we evaluate our ministry. One of the ways by which we evaluate our ministry. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that on Thursday. Okay, I'm going to go over these for you a little bit more then. Okay, so this is who we are. This is our operating system. This is our purpose. We're trying to reach and equip students for Christ. And these are the things we want coming out of students. This is what we want to see. But we want it to come out of their heart. So here's the big question. Okay, how do we do that? How do we reach that? How do we see people's hearts change in terms of what we're doing? It's just such a thin line, all the things you're saying here. I think the only answer I can give and still be sitting here is believing in my word. It's the Holy Spirit. I mean, yeah, we have a purpose. Yes, we're, like, we want the kids to be preaching the gospel themselves and all these things that flow out of that input. Right. Very good. Yeah, I, I think maybe that's where we have to start, right? Is that, like, I can't change their hearts. I can't do that. But there are some tools that God has given you by which every one of your hearts in this room that have been changed have been changed. Okay? Um, every one of you in this room, I'm assuming you know Jesus Christ, came to know him how? How'd you know him? How'd you come to know him? Somebody else. Somebody else, what, what did they do? Did they put a gun to your head and say, you have to believe in Jesus? <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. What do they teach you? That's good. To, yeah, to submit your life to, why would they, yeah, go ahead, what yeah, I mean, like, really, like, you know, it, it says in Scripture that there's a message of reconciliation that God has given us, and that is where the power comes from in change of people. So, what I want you to see is there, there are really two tools that God has given you that will deal with people's hearts. There are two of them, okay? This is where, this is where the philosophy of ministry gets excruciatingly hard for us, but there are two of them, okay? One is the gospel. The message of the gospel. The message of reconciliation with God. Okay? None of you in this room know God outside of the gospel. You were all told the gospel. That message is a message of power and transformation in your life. That's how you know him, right? But now you're all also growing in your life, and that is coming about not only because of the gospel, but because of the word of God. Okay, And those two things are the two tools that God has given you to reach people's hearts. You don't change people's hearts, but when people encounter his word and when they encounter his gospel, they are changed. Okay, Now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit. First of all, I want to say these two things are very important for you to realize they have a relationship with each other. Okay, um, What is the word of God like without the gospel? What now? Set of rules. Okay. Who are people, who are religious people in the world that believe in God's word but not the gospel? Jews? Muslims? The Pharisees? And half of Christians, probably. Just kidding about that part. But the, 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 the word of God without the gospel is empty. Okay. It's robbed of its very heart if the gospel is not there. Jesus is the very heart. It's what all the scriptures are hanging on, right? But at the same time, what is the gospel without the word of God? What's the message of rec reconciliation without God's word? If you, if you just say there's a message about how you can know God, but you omit God's word, what do you get? Very good, yeah. A truncated gospel. Yeah. What does that look like, though? Very, very good. Like, the whole idea of the bad news is gone. The whole idea, you know, it, it's confusing without Scripture. What else? <laughs> Say it again. That was beautiful. That's exactly right. Moralistic therapeutic deism. I couldn't say it any better. That's exactly what you get when you have the gospel without the word of God. 
okay? It, it, it robs it of its authority. It, where is it coming from if it's not coming from the mouth of our Lord? You know, uh, where is it coming from? If, uh, the very way you guys know about the gospel is how? Where does it come from? Where does the message come from? Scripture, right? That's where the gospel message is found, is in Scripture. And so these two have a, a relationship with one another. The second thing I want you to know is that tomorrow... Uh, Justin is going to talk to you more explicitly about these things that we call our principles. And when we talk about the gospel, we're going we're gonna to expand that out for you into three things. One is justification, one is sanctification, and one is glorification. They're what we call our principles, but basically they are a summary of what it means to be reconciled to God and to live for his kingdom from the beginning of time to the end. Okay? That God, before the beginning of the creation of the world, had purpose for you to be his. And how the story of redemption is that throughout history, throughout all things that have occurred throughout your life and to the very end of time, has purpose for you to be his. For him to be your God and you to be his people. Okay? And that's the story of scripture. That's the story of the gospel. And it's explained with these three terms. And just is going to go over these things. But what... Okay, so, so ultimately... You have two tools in your tool bag with students. Those two tools are the word of God and the gospel. And so we have to be asking ourselves, how are we pushing these things into people's hearts? How is the word of God and the gospel being pushed into people's hearts in the way that we live, in the way that we do ministry? How are you doing that? If you have a lock-in, what's happening? You know, a lock-in, you can have a lock-in and not, you know, you can have a lock-in and not have a meeting where you're sharing the gospel, but just have opportunities to build relationships for your volunteers and leaders where they can eventually push that in, right? One thing that I like to tell my youth staff is this, is that youth ministry has to be seen as a long-term process. If you're looking for immediate fruit in youth ministry, you're going to be disappointed and you're going to hate your job and you're going to quit, okay? And so... Youth ministry is a long-term process. There are people, when I, I first started doing youth ministry when I was uh, right out of college. Um, there are some kids now that were in my youth ministry then uh, that are now married, have kids, and that sort of stuff. But what I've seen is that over time, um, little infusion, little, little places where their hearts were, were moved toward the gospel, little places where the word of God was pushed toward their hearts, where I've done it, countless other people have done it, over time, it's finally pushed them <clears throat> to being people who are moving toward the kingdom of God in their life, okay? And uh, I've had students that uh, now are 30 years old that call me and say, hey man, something you said to me when I was in fifth grade, uh, I still remember. And it still matters to me, okay? And I, and, I, and I have to think, it was God pushing his word and gospel into their heart then. It, that's, 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 the, that's the hope that we have in ministry is for that to happen. Um, we say that we try to do this. Sorry, the chart's getting complicated now. Um, we try to do this with, in, three, in three arenas or avenues. Okay, you, This is probably one of the more famous things that you hear all you have people saying. But uh, the three avenues are large group, small group, and one-to-one, -one, okay? And that is, uh, we're trying to push the gospel and the word of God into people's hearts and to see change in their lives by uh, meeting in a large group, by meeting in small groups, and by meeting one-on-one -on -one with them. Now, um, this thing is going to crazy. Um, why do we do that? Why, why do those things, why do we try to do all three? Why, why do we do that? Do y'all have all three in your ministries? Um, Jesus did all three. We'll start there. Um, when did Jesus meet with large groups of people? Can you give me an example? Preaching to the crowds. Sermon on the Mount, right? When did Jesus uh, spend time with smaller groups of people? Disciples, right? The majority of his public ministry he spent with 12 dudes. Okay. When are times that Jesus spent time one-on-one -on -one with people? Peter, yes, lots with Peter. Who else? Was it Nicodemus? Great. Who else? Was it always Christians that he spent time with? 
Woman at the well, non-Christians. He's spending one-on-one time with all sorts of people. So here's the question. Um, here are your three avenues of ministry, large group, small group, one-to-one. Which one is the most important? What? <laughs> they're all important. Yes, they're all equal. Like, look, but, but like our typical approach is that which one is the most important? The large group. We put more emphasis and work into that thing. But like, you know, your large group, they're all sort of interdependent upon one another. Like I had one friend of mine who used to say, uh, one of my mentors in the faith once said that your sermons will only be as good as your one-on-ones. Otherwise, you're not going to know what to say. You're not going to know the people that you're speaking to. Your small groups that you have with your students where you're meeting and talking to them and dialoguing with them about the gospel are only going to be as good as your one-on-ones. And they're only going to be as informed as the large group pushes into them. They're all important, okay? I think, that, um, I think about the avenues of ministry like an iceberg sometimes. And what sticks out at the top is the large group, but there is so much more going on underneath. There are hundreds of relationships with people, meeting with one another, talking with one another, spending long-term uh, relationships with one another, building things over time, serving with one another. And that is the real meat of what you're doing, Right? It's very important to see that that is the real meat of what's going on in your ministry. So large group, small group, and one-to-one, that's going to be a great evaluator as well to think about what you're doing. What are we doing in our large group meeting? What other kind of large groups do we have other than just our, you know, if you have a, you know, worship service sort of thing? Or do you have other large group things like a bowling night? Or we're all large, and how does the large group work when you do that? What kind of questions are you asking yourself about those things? Small groups. When you, do you have a small groups ministry? Have you thought it through? Um, what are your small groups aiming to do? Why do they aim to do those things? How are they connected to the large group if they are connected to the large group? Um, are, are, do you have people that are leading those small groups that can really help students? Are they trained? Do you care if they're trained? Um, one-on-one, do you have a one-on-one ministry with your students? And what is that like? And look, the bottom line is, You're not going to be good at all of these things. You're not, okay? But you can think about them, and you can grow in them, all right? And they're all three vitally important to push the gospel and the word of God into people's hearts. You know, every one of you who knows Jesus today knows him because of one of those three avenues of ministry. Someone either talked to you about it, you heard about it in a small group, or you heard somebody preach the gospel. None of you were in a forest and all of a sudden realized that Jesus was the Lord and Savior. It didn't happen, okay? <clears throat> you learned about it, you heard about it through one of the avenues of ministry, and they're all important in terms of what you're doing in your life. Um, I have a, this sheet at the end here. It's an overview. It says the tree at the end, and it really is a great way of thinking about how all these things work together, okay, in terms of um, ministry or our philosophy of ministry working like an organism, All right, Um, and we'll just look at these things. Notice at the bottom, okay, the presuppositions about who we are are the roots of the tree, okay? The Bible, the church, God's work, the individual learning demographics, all those things are sort of at the very root level of who we are. You can see it says the root of the tree grow out of the soil and they rarely are seen, but they determine how the tree will grow. So our presuppositions flow out of scripture. They affect how we minister, but they themselves are not our focus, okay? Um, the scripture is the soil also in this. It, the soil nourishes the tree, enables it to grow strong and bear fruit. Similarly, scripture is our foundation. The trunk of the tree are our uh, principles, the, the things, the change agents that we see in people's lives. It's scripture, justification, sanctification, and glorification. And then what is the fruit that's born in the tree? What are they? Growing in grace. Uh, evangelism. Missions fellowship, service, biblical world life view, all those things are what's blooming out of the tree because uh, God is at work in this way. But of course, the thing we know is that um, no tree is going to grow unless it is watered from above. And so you see the Holy Spirit up here, he's the one that's enabling all these things to happen. And it says, no matter uh, the goodness of the soil, the depth of the roots, or the strength of the trunk, without rain, the tree will die. Similarly, the Holy Spirit rains down his work upon a biblical ministry and gives it life, causing the tree to grow and to bear fruit. I I think that's a helpful way to think about this, is that um, 
being reflective about the way we are doing and thinking about ministry. Now, I know a lot of what I've told you right now has been like drinking out of a fire hydrant, and you all look tired because you've traveled long distances today, and now you're hearing this and you're like, I haven't really thought about ministry very much, and uh, I don't feel a lot of worth in my soul right now. I, I feel uh, a little sad about my ministry. I feel like a failure. Um, I, I don't feel like I'm doing a great job. And what I want you to know is that that's okay. Okay? The whole point we're here is that little by little, you are reflective about what you're doing and you're moving your students toward Jesus Christ. Little by little. I want you to unclench your shoulders and rest in Him. That no matter what is missing or how little you've thought, uh, but there is movement that can be part of your um, ministry. There is uh, hope in our lives as Christians to move toward Him in the way that we're doing ministry. And my hope is just to stimulate you thinking about these things a little bit. Okay, That's the main thing I want, was for you to think a little bit more deeply about ministry in this way. All right, I'm going to end here. Tomorrow, uh, on Thursday, we're going to talk more about our goals and uh, how we evaluate our ministries uh, with them in some other ways. And uh, we're also going to talk about the operating system that goes on behind what we're doing and the way we think about the world. Um, questions about things. I know this is a lot. Questions? Really? Anyone? You're all worn out, aren't you? Just worn out, tired. Thank you for giving me a little bit of your time to think about this today. Let me pray for us, and uh, you can go and be a little reflective. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, uh, we are very uh, thankful for your son, and we are very thankful that um, he is at work in the world. I pray that you would help us now to... Um, Take our fears and our feelings of failure, our pride about how good we're doing and how we have thought about these things. And Father, that you would, uh, through that, move us toward you this week. I pray that you would help these guys to be reflective about their ministries, um, that um, they would question their motives they would question their movements. And as they do so, Father, that they would want to move um, toward reaching and equipping their students for you. Um, thank you for their ears and for letting them hear today. Would you help us, Father, to seek your kingdom together uh, this week? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys.